Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you can hear me. Uh, it's late in the day, so I'd like to thank you for staying around, especially the speakers. Uh, it's my honor that you're here. Um, I've been in China, I think, a pretty long time now, and I'm often asked if I find it difficult to live here. And my answer is always no. I'm a Canadian, and I'm a very proud Canadian. And not only am I Canadian, but I'm from a city called Toronto, which is the most successful multicultural city on earth. I am used to walking down the street, bumping into somebody, and knowing that probably they don't speak the same language as I do. In fact, my own grandfather and I had trouble communicating with each other most of his life. So I come to China with that experience. China or Canada, same issue. Second, second reason that I say no is, has to do with a lesson, the most important lesson I learned in university. Uh, it was from a cognitive psychology course, and it taught me everything I needed to know about human thinking. It is the Waysen four card selection task. And the Waysen four card selection task is a psychological test to determine uh, whether uh, a test case is a person who is able to think logically, to access pure log logic and making a decision or not. Now, I have brought you an example of the wasting four card selection task, and because I'm a, somebody who actually failed the test, I'm going to refer to this paper to, to give you a, an example of how this works. You are shown a set of four cards placed on a table, each of which has a number on one side and a colored patch on the other side. The visible faces of the cards show three, eight, red, and brown. That's a red and a brown. Uh, the visible, um, I'm sorry, which cards, which card or cards must you turn over in order to test the truth of the proposition, the syllogism, that if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is red. So if a card shows an even number on one face, its opposite face is red. Does anyone know the answer? Does anyone in the room know the answer to this uh, proposition? Well, yes, give it a shot. Red. Well, actually, there are two cards. The correct is, response is to turn over the cards showing eight and brown. Eight and brown, uh, but no other card. Only a card which has an even number on one face and which is not red on the other face can invalidate the rule, okay? If we turn over the card labeled three and find that it is red, this does not invalidate the rule. On the other hand, if the brown card has the label four, this invalidates the rule. It has an even number but is not red. The interpretation of if here, that's the syllogism, if, is the material conditional in classical logic. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Only 4% of all those tested get this right, okay? However, however, the, the fact that people do not think logically, I'm sure is not a surprise to you, to any of you in here. Um, but it leads me to my grand discovery, which we will call the content effect, the content effect. So, if you recontextualize the information on the cards so that the Information on the cards is familiar to the person taking this test. Uh, for example, I'm an expat living in Shanghai in a suburb kind of near Hongqiao Terminal 2 Airport. Uh, every day when I drive past a, a major intersection, there's an old woman who begs me for money when I stop my car. So if on one side of the card you put the, the name of the intersection at which I stop, and you say on the other side of the card, is there or is there not an old woman, even I, who do not think particularly logically, will get it right, okay? So that teaches us that people can un only understand what they already know. People can only understand what they already know. And um, this is very important in the world in which I live. I live in the world of creativity, I um, live and work in China, and we create uh, products that are meant to communicate with the general public, with particular clients. And uh, to communicate means to be able to impart meaning. And to impart meaning means to be able to understand what your client understands. 
or understand what the, what the population understands. If you're not able to do that, you cannot successfully function in your job. Um, an example uh, of another way to interpret this card would be a local friend of mine, a Chinese woman, the other day was telling me about um, a, a man we both know, a foreign man who um, she and a, another Chinese friend of hers were having a conversation about. They had decided that he was the type of person, this is a person, by the way, I have some respect for, the type of person who would cheat on his wife. So they had decided that he was a type, and he was the type that would cheat on his wife. And I was wondering, what were the signifiers that, uh, that uh, this person portrayed or contained, which would give this impression to this woman? Because I personally did not see it. Uh, so um, the type, the type. If a simple decision like that, a simple communication process like that is already so complicated, imagine in the world of uh, communication in China with the contracts to sign, with the co-production partners to deal with, with the, the need to sell product or ideas, how complicated it must be. And in fact, it is. Um, my experience in China uh, goes through three phases over 10 years, which have led me to the uh, ability to understand that without taking into account, as we've already heard today to some extent, uh, the Chinese understanding of the world, without uh, taking into account Chinese meaning, we cannot produce product that will speak to the Chinese. And in fact, we just recently heard uh, a, a talk uh, about Hollywood and China going to Hollywood and Hollywood trying to produce product for China. Uh, one of, I just recently attended the um, Hong Kong uh, Film Festival and Film Market and one of the biggest issues there was co-production scripts uh, between uh, foreign countries, particularly Hollywood and China. And the fact that the single biggest issue, the single biggest problem is that no one has yet come up with a good enough script that talks to both cultures. So, um, phase one of my experience in China is what I call the bang my head against the wall um, and try to uh, force foreign ideas on a local audience phase. Uh, it is the Shanghai Fringe Festival phase, Fringe Shanghai. The Fringe Shanghai, which took place, by the way, in 2006, I'm one of the founders, uh, was uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, it taught me a lot uh, very quickly about uh, the performing arts in China. First thing that it taught me is that the word festival itself has an implication, a meaning, a connotation here that is different from where I come from. Only the government can run festivals. So you cannot, in fact, uh, have a festival. You cannot call a festival a festival unless you are the government in China. Therefore, we called it Fringe Shanghai. Um, the second issue that we had to deal with was the fact that it, was, it is an alternative arts festival. Alternative and um, experimental. Alternative and experimental are also two words which on the Waste and Four Card Selection task would uh, the Chinese uh, person being tested might have some difficulty with. One of the biggest issues we had was the need to educate the audience as to what alternative and experimental meant. And I went on a 10 university uh, tour in Shanghai to give talks about what alternative and experimental art meant. Um, unfortunately, that was not, those were not the only locations that I gave these talks. We also, we the founders of the festival, found ourselves in front of a tribunal with the, uh, the Shanghai Cultural Bureau explaining to them what in fact alternative art was and why China needs an alternative to the art it already has. So that was my first experience in my life with uh, a censorship at that level. And uh, that was in 2006, and it was a very interesting lesson. Uh, in the end, the festival did go forward. We were allowed to have the festival because we aligned ourselves with some of the um, most uh, well-known arts organizations in the city of Shanghai, where there are people who are inspired and, uh, and motivated to, to work with uh, people who bring new ideas. Uh, these people basically saved the festival because we used their locations and we used their talent and we were not closed down uh, by the government because of it. 
However, there are ways to stop things without actually stopping them. And in China, there's a bureaucratic process required to put on uh, any show, by the way, any, uh, any sort of cultural uh, exhibition of any sort, you need to get a permit to do so. And uh, it's a P1, is a performance permit, they call it in Chinese. And the performance permit uh, has to do with going through the Cultural Bureau. Um, the Cultural Bureau uh, will very rarely say no to you, but they will do something that will prevent you from being, achieving success. And in the case of Fringe Shanghai, uh, they withheld our performance permit until a couple of days before the actual festival. There is a law in China. Without a performance permit, you cannot sell tickets to a, uh, an arts event. And if you cannot sell tickets to an art, uh, arts event, you cannot make money. And if you cannot make money, you will fail. You will not be able to put on that wonderful festival that isn't a festival ever again. <laughs> and in fact, uh, that was not the end of our experience in 2006. Uh, there was an issue with our media sponsors. There was, word went out that one of the editors of one of the newspapers that was our media sponsor was sacked because uh, the Propaganda Bureau had put out a, a media a blackout for the Fringe Festival. So uh, essentially, we were supposed to be blacked out in the media. No ticket sales, no media, but no, 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 no. No one ever said no. That was the end of phase one. Phase two, I'm sorry, there were some positive benefits to phase one. Uh, phase one allowed me to develop, to develop Guanxi. That is, uh, these particular organizations uh, worked together with me and I was allowed to develop co-production co uh, friends and which led to phase two. My, my um, first co-production television documentary with Shanxi TV up in Xi'an. In this case, I brought um, Shanxi TV to Toronto and we filmed an arts festival called the Dim Sum Festival, which is held every year. Um, it's a, an Asian performing arts festival in Toronto. And uh, the intent of the show, by the way, was to, for, on my part, was to uh, demonstrate that young Asian Canadians are uh, reinvestigating their Chinese history uh, or their Asian past to create new art forms. That was uh, what I was intent on doing. My co-director from Shanxi TV, on the other hand, was interested in the, uh, the Chinese opera star who had been invited by the festival to come over there and give uh, courses in Chinese opera. Um, I did not realize how, how much we had misunderstood each other until we got to the editing floor in Xi'an and I recognized that most of the footage of the multicultural artists who were uh, discussing the political ramifications of what they were doing had been cut in favor of a single uh, workshop that was held for elderly housewives uh, at a, a shoe museum in downtown Toronto uh, by this gentleman where they were allowed to put on Chinese clothes and walk around. So that was in fact the uh, the, uh, what I call good intention phase, but misunderstanding of each other's uh, desires. The third phase, Shanghai TV, international channel. We're talking about 2008. 2008 created an event that changed, transformed China. We all know about it. It was the Olympics. Uh, this is what I call the, we're on the same side, the same game, the same vision phase. In this phase, uh, I worked together with uh, Shanghai TV to create a documentary series about the development of amateur sport in China since the 1920s. Uh, it's, this is what I call the successful phase because it is what the earlier speaker was talking about. We found meaning together. The same si similar meaning we created together. We created a product that spoke to both of us for in, the, in the same way. The ability of sport, to raise the human spirit. Sport, as a non-political uh, activity, is something that actually can transcend culture. And in this case, we were able to use sport to talk about the sport, the development of sport since the 1920s in Shanghai. And at that time, and still now, uh, my, my goal, my desire, was for China to win gold, just as theirs was. And that does not make me Chinese. 
I have not become Chinese, but I have become someone who appreciates the aspirations of the Chinese and uh, am excited by it. So this has some ramifications for cultural product as well. Um, certainly this, uh, the ramifications are of great interest to Hollywood. They're of great interest to the big film corporations in Beijing or in Shanghai who are looking for uh, co-production uh, materials that will speak to the entire world. China's dreams are becoming the world's dreams. Uh, we saw that happening in 2008. I'd like to wake, make one point. Censorship has not been eliminated from the uh, situation. We saw earlier a little kip, clip from Mission Impossible 3. Um, that clip was actually something that you would not have seen in the Chinese uh, version of Mission Impossible 3. Uh, in fact, the, the version that was distributed at Chinese cinemas uh, censored that because in China there is no laundry hanging outside. Okay, so the clip that we actually saw would have been maybe from an overseas uh, DVD or something like that, but in, in fact the Chinese are sensitive to the fact that uh, laundry is hung in China. So that would have been censored. So there are certain things that have to be overlooked, but the question is, the question is, do you want to be in this game? From a, a creative point of view, if you want to be in the game, uh, you've got to be in the game, and you have to engage to be in this game. And uh, to engage means to rethink, and to rethink every day, and to keep your eyes open, and to seek partners who are uh, aligned with you, and to be on the inside, by the way. So a lot of the talk that we've heard has been uh, about uh, corporations or entities that are looking at China from the outside. But to be from the inside and to be of the inside, uh, at least in my experience, has been the key to success in China. And, oh, I'm sorry, has been the key to success in China. And um, so, uh, as my hypothesis says, uh, you know, engage or get out of the game. And by the way, that, that guy that uh, those Chinese women were talking about, that was me. <laughs> Thank you very much.